Welcome to episode 51 of the Payers and Players podcast. Please follow us on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. Our handle is Payers Players. If you'd like to reach us, we can be reached by email at payersandplayers at gmail.com. We're really excited about this episode, episode 51, with Peyton Stearns. Also upcoming, we've got Jack Newman of the Austin Tennis Academy. Also, Adam Blitcher, who is a tennis professional, but also runs an incredible tennis podcast. And then finally, Ohio State standout, J.J. Wool. So keep your eyes open for these awesome upcoming episodes. Also, if you enjoy our podcast, we've added a donate button to the website. So you can go to payersandplayers.com if you would like to donate. And finally, we have a website, which is www.payersandplayers.com. Which we, where we have all of our show notes as well as an extensive library of video and photo footage of many of today's top and rising stars, including today's guest, Peyton Stearns. Peyton is from Cincinnati, Ohio. She is the number five recruit in her class currently. She'll be soon making her decision on where she's going to attend college next year. In the past, she's a, she has participated in all of the Junior Grand Slams, and she's been prim- competing primarily on the pro circuit for the past year. I got a chance to see her at the Lexington Challenger, where uh, we got to chat a little bit, and I thought she'd be a really good guest to um, come on and talk about her, her development and what she's going to be doing next. So without further ado, let's bring on Peyton. So Peyton, welcome to the show. We're, uh, we're excited to have you on the show. Thank you. I'm excited to be here. Great. So one of the things that I have thought is pretty fascinating is the number of sort of elite tennis players that are coming out of Cincinnati right now. Um, you've got the McNallys, you've got the Wolves, um, you know, you and your brother are both very high level players. So can you talk a little bit about what the junior development scene was maybe five, six, eight years ago in Cincinnati and how that, you know, it's a place like Cincinnati was able to develop you know, such high-level players across the board, both boys and girls? I just feel like Cincinnati's a big tennis town. Um, Like, a lot of people here play tennis, and I feel like all the pros and coaches really know what they're talking about. Um, And everyone here kind of works as a a community in tennis. Everyone kind of works together, and I think that's awesome. So I think that really helps kind of everyone out, and that's, why we have a lot of good tennis players here. And so how much, or I guess, you know, so in those early years, were you and Katie and um, JJ and John in the same groups together? Were you at the same clubs at the same time? Um, I went to the same club as the McNally's at one point, but then I ended up switching. Um, I think, the Wolves are a little bit older than me, so they were going into right. college or working with different people at that time, but right. all the same coaches and stuff, you know, they talked and worked together. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And and how involved were your parents in your development process? I, I don't know that they were tennis players per se, but how, you know, what was their role in sort of de- determining, you know, who your coaches were and how much you played and, and that kind of stuff. Could you talk a little bit about how, what your parents' philosophy was with, for you guys? Yeah. They actually, my dad played a little bit of tennis, but my mom didn't play tennis at all. So when she was looking for coaches, she looked for coaches that were going to push us, you know, not waste our time um, and really, like, get on us um, at a young age. And they were really involved in my tennis and my brothers as well. And I think that's why I'm such a good player today is because she was so like into my tennis and she would like on days I didn't want to work hard. She'd be like, okay, pick it up. Let's go. And I think that kind of motivated me to get going because she's my mom. Um, Mm -hmm. And I mean, you look at Agassi and what his dad did with him. I mean, that's, that's crazy at a young age, but I don't think, parents should be that extreme but I think parents should definitely be involved in their kids tennis and making sure like the coaches are doing what they're supposed to do hold them hold them accountable right 
Exactly, yes. Like the coaches aren't just, you know, taking their money and doing the hour lesson. They're actually, the kids are actually learning something from that lesson. Right. Yeah, and that's a great point. So what would you say to the to the coach who says, I just want the parents to stay out of the way? Um, I wouldn't quite agree with that because, I mean, my the parents are the ones paying. They deserve to see what's going on. Um, my parents, whenever a coach said that to them, they would uh, kind of see that as, okay, they may not be working hard or they may be doing something that we don't like. Um, so they, that was a red flag for them. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm a believer in that. The, the parent has to be heavily involved. You know, the, the, you, you can't really pay for every ball that the kid hits. And so you've got to work with the coach to know sort of what to work on. You, you know, like say if you, it's like homework. So if you, if the coach is working on something with the player, you know, they got, they have to do that work outside the coach and then come back for the coach to get, you know, the feedback and, and see how the things are progressing. But if you're do if you're having the coach be everything, you know, the parent, the trainer, everything, you know, you, you, the parent has no, you know, like you say, they, they have no um, role in that, then they're, you don't really know what you're going to get because there's no one's more invested in their kids than the parents. And so, exactly. you know, to, to, for, for a coach to say that, you know, I, I need to stay out of the way, then I think that's sort of a red flag, and I, I'm, gl I'm glad to hear you say that. Yeah, definitely. So can you paint a picture for us what it, what your tennis training looked like, say, from 10 to 12 years old? What what were you doing on a daily basis? What tournaments were you playing? How much were you playing? How serious were you? Um, At the age of 10, I think I was just really starting to get serious in tennis, like just play tennis. Um, I think I did track for my grade school at the time, but I, I really didn't play a whole lot. I maybe did clinic and a lesson here or there. Um, I played a few USTA tournaments. Um, maybe when I was around 11 or 12, I started playing a little more tournaments, picking up maybe another hour a day, doing some more fitness. Um, but I really wouldn't say I like solely played tennis until I was about 13 or 14 even. Wow. wow. And, you know, if, if anybody has not seen Peyton hit the ball before, she hits the cover off the ball. I mean, she really <laughs> – she hits a huge ball. So where where did that come from? Was that something that, you know, you, was, it, was it a natural thing or was it something that you, you developed through some some training and, you know, some focus on that? Talk a little bit about how you developed your game. Um, I've honestly been able to hit the balls that hard since I picked up a racket. Um, mm -hmm. I think that kind of power came from my gymnastics background. I had a lot of, like, strength as a young kid. And I think that helped strength. as well. Yeah, yeah right. exactly. Um, so I think that helped. And I also had a really good coach as a young kid who taught me the strokes and, like, how to do all the technique for it so I could harness that power. And, I mean, right. it's really helped. <laughs> yeah, because, yeah, uh, like I say, when, when, if, you're, if you go to a tournament or you watch her hit the ball, if you don't know who's hitting the ball, you'd think it's, you know, a six foot four guy. I mean, she, the, 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 ra the sound coming off the racket's uh, phenomenal. So uh, that, that's, that's really great. Thanks. Thank you. Yeah. So, but, yeah. so was there ever a, a girl though that you played and still maybe to this day who was the total opposite, right? Somebody who didn't miss, who made you make a million balls that you really struggled to beat. Was there somebody like that that you played? Yeah, there's girls like that all the time. Um, even now at the pro events, there are girls who will just make you make balls. And mm -hmm. honestly, I used to struggle playing them because with my game, I'm like, I want to hit big all the time. Um, right. it's, it's amazing to hit that big all the time, but it's just not possible <laughs> to hit winners, you know, blast balls. You're going to have off days. So I've kind of learned how to grind with them, wait for the right ball and attack on it. And if I'm patient that day, I'll do really well in the match. If I'm not patient, then things usually don't go well. Yeah. Yeah. And so yeah. for you, it came um, down to you having to adjust to be a little bit more patient 
not necessarily, you know, I hear people all the time say, as you get older, the, the, the what they quote, the pushers, right? But not the, the, what they mean by that is the people who make a ton of balls, they, mm-hmm. they disappear. But what you're saying is basically you, when you played somebody that was very consistent, you kind of had to find a way to make a few more balls and look for your opportunities. Is that right? Correct, yes. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, and, and you know, like Robert, you alluded to the the sort of the the myth or whatever that pushers eventually go away. You know, I, I'm not sure that they do. They just get better at what they do, but you know, it, 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 they, have become, they have to become more skilled at it. But you know, you go to college matches and you'll still see you know rallies that last forever. You know, and and those you know those those kind of players they don't you know disappear. They they just find different ways to do things and they you know develop different uh, you know formulas for success, but um, you know they don't go away necessarily. But like Peyton says, is you know as a, as a big hitter, you've got as those pushers or whatever we want to call them do develop you know some strength and some gain. You've got the 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 counterpoint is that is just to be a little more patient and look for your opportunities. And then execute the, the when you get those chances. So you know it's, it's not it's not a case that those pushers are ever just going to disappear. And then you know you'll have a free you know free reign of the the big hitters. You know you still you still have to deal with those pushers or retrievers or whatever we're going to call them, no matter what level I think, right? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, they definitely well, and, are still and, there. <laughs> that that and the thing about it is 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 that's not a negative, right? I mean. You look at Djokovic, he can play a point out for a long period of time, and if you're going to beat Nadal and Djokovic, you're you're going to have to be a little bit patient, right? And everybody acts I like agree, yeah. the folk. I mean, they act like the folks who are patient are are going to disappear and go away because it's a big boy game, or you have to hit hard, you have to hit through them. But but it comes down to styles, right? Some people are aggressive, mm-hmm. some people aren't aggressive. And and it's it, it's are you better at being aggressive than they are at being safe? Would you agree? Yes. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you yeah. supposed to be better at what that? you do. Well, give us yeah, an example in your career really of, a, your game, of a specific. Yeah. Well, and give me an, an example of a specific player. You don't have to say their name if you don't want, but you can. Who every time you play them, you knew. I'm going to have to be able to make five to ten balls or I'm going to lose the point. Yeah, um, I don't know if – I won't mention her name, but I've actually played her twice now. Um, I played her last December, and I knew she was a grinder. She was going to make me make balls. Um, and she was really – and if I hit the ball short, she could attack like any good player. Mm-hmm. And I, lo- I think I lost to her like three and three maybe. And – I've really been working on staying patient, like waiting for the right shot against these kind of, like kinds of players. And I recently played her in September, October, and I won in three sets because I stayed patient the whole time, didn't let anything rattle me, um, just made the ball and went for the right shot. And I think growing up playing a lot of these grinders, it's it really helps your game out a lot. Um, right. It forces you to make the ball or else you're not going to win. It's that simple. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, you know, that, that's right. And, you know, I think that we should have some appreciation for that. And it's just part of the development pathway is learning, learning to handle uncomfortable players that you don't want to play. And if you, if you make the mistake of thinking that, well, I don't have to change my game. I don't, I don't have to do anything different because in four years they won't be around. I think you're fooling yourself because they will be there. You've just got to get better at what you do. And if your game is to be aggressive and to hit big, then you've got to do it with more precision and more patience, like you say. And then, you know, that way you'll be able to solve that, those guys down the road. But, you know, at, to your point, it is good for your development to play those players that you sort of hate to play against because it, that's how you're going to get better. Exactly. Well, and, and I'll never forget talking to a parent this summer, and they and they were very um, almost irritated that their daughter was playing a, a young lady who was very consistent. And they were saying, well, we, we're ready to play big girl tennis. And the reality was the young lady that was playing them was doing what worked. I mean, if you're, if you're a baseball pitcher and you're pitching against somebody who can hit a home run off the fastball, 
but they can't touch the curveball, then you throw them curveballs, right? And, exactly, and yeah. So to me, it comes down to being a problem solver, right? So it may not be pretty, but if it works, it works, right? Yeah, I mean, you have to find a way to win, and if it's the way to win, you do it. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you, you see it, you see it all the time, especially in college tennis. On the women's side, these some of these girls have, you know, underhand serves, strokes that are not considered pretty or you know anything, but they just find ways to get the ball back, and they, they're they're effective at neutralizing points. And you know, it's the hardest thing in the world to to deal with, but it's uh, something that if you want to get to the top, you've got to be you've got to respect that and, and go through it. Yes. Well, yeah. So talk to us real quick about how you balance your, cause, cause Scott just described you as a, as when he gets around you, it's like a six, four man hitting the ball. So mm-hmm. was there a time where you had to realize like, okay, I got to dial it back a little and keep the ball in play until I get an opportunity. I mean, did you lose early because you were overly aggressive and you realize like, okay, I've got to, I've got to dial this back until I get my opportunity. Yeah. I think, um, as a young junior, you know, when I was 13, 14, 15, um, I would lose pretty early on because of the choices I made and how big I would go on some shots. But I feel like over the past like two, three years, that's what I've been working on a lot. It's harnessing it, you know, my 70% ball is some people's or majority of the girls I play like 90%, 100% ball. Mm-hmm. So I really don't right. need to be hitting all out all the time. Um, so I've been working on hitting my 70, 75% ball in the point. And then, you know, when I get the short ball, not even going full swing because it's not needed. Right. Right. And I, yeah. Um, and I feel like I've been yeah. doing a lot better lately because of that. Good. Well, so I know that you've trained with uh, Todd Whittem, and we've had Todd on the show a couple of times. But I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about your training with him and something you take. What 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 maybe is your takeaway from training with him, and and how that training went? Yeah, I went there uh, at the beginning of this year for a few months. It was awesome. Mm-hmm. Um, it was very structured, which I don't have here, so I kind of have to make my own. Um, court time because I go to different clubs where at Todd's everything was set. There's set times. Um, Pierre is the guy that works with him as well. He's amazing. I've known him since I was 12. Yeah. That's how I met Todd. Um, but, you know, they really just pushed me and I felt like they kind of made me break the wall a little bit where out of, get me out of my comfort zone because I feel like I was kind of satisfied with myself for a while and they made me strive for a little bit more. Um, They really helped me as well, harnessing my power and waiting for the right shot. They taught me how to hit a heavy ball and wait for that right ball to attack for. They've also helped my footwork and my slice, like, tremendously. Um, I really didn't know how to slice. It was pretty bad for a while, and now it's probably, probably one of the better shots in my game now. I can do it on a more consistent basis and i use it a lot more now okay so it wasn't just you know drills and and training it was also technical as well yes it was everything anything i needed todd got on it and pierre got on it as well yeah yeah and, and one thing i noticed about his social media presence and we've had him on twice is is he he really advertises, and I hate to say advertises, but he he, it's an impression from a parental side that that he will handle it right. As a parent, yeah. mm-hmm. you can trust him. You don't have to be involved if you don't want to be. You can if you want to, but you're going to get such a well-rounded environment that if you want as a parent to just let him handle it, it's okay. Was that the perception yeah. you got from an injury standpoint? I mean, the injury prevention standpoint? Yeah, I would agree with that. I mean, Todd, you know, he said you're going to get the same workout if your parent a parent isn't here. And I did because I stayed with him for a few months, actually. And, you know, he worked me hard no matter what. Um, he wasn't just taking the money. He actually cared about me as a person and a player. Right. 
Right. And and so was that a situation where, you know, you're a little bit more mature, you're and I'm not sure how old you would, you would you would be at this point, but it wasn't a case where, you know, in the early stages, you know, where your your mom was very involved you know, making sure that every practice was structured or you're getting everything out of, you know, whatever coach you were working with was. By this point, you sort of knew sort of where you were in your game and development, and she knew what she knew, and she knew that Todd could take it 100% and wouldn't have to have somebody looking over her shoulder. Is that, is that where that was? Yes, and we also knew Pierre from um, before right. when I was younger, and he's the kind of coach that doesn't let anything fly. And my mom trusted yeah. him as well. And he said, come work with Todd and I. And my mom trusted Pierre completely and said, go do it. Good. Good. Uh, good. So what advice would you give to a 12-year-old girl or boy who's maybe in your shoes when, when you were 12? You know, I would just tell them that their main goal should be to work on their game they shouldn't be worrying about winning or losing at this time because honestly, 12, 13, and 14, it doesn't matter. Like if you're winning or losing, it matters when you're 16, 17, 18, that's when you're in your prime. That's when you want to be having your game complete. And like, that's when you want to be winning. But at 12, 13, 14, like you want to be working on your game and developing yourself instead of winning and maybe not doing the correct stuff on court. So and, let and, me let and, me push back on that. So uh, real quick is is you hear it's such a struggle, right? Because let's say you're mm-hmm. a parent of an 11 year old, and just imagine in your head two 11 year olds, one who is a pusher and beats everybody, right? Mm-hmm. But the strokes are ugly. They don't attack a short ball, but because they don't miss, they're beating everybody. And then you have another 11-year-old who's super aggressive, very powerful, but because they're aggressive, they miss a lot, right? How do, you, yeah. how do you balance that? I mean, that young, aggressive player isn't winning much. Everyone can see the talent, but they're not winning that much, right? And mm-hmm. how, do you keep, how do you keep them from losing kind of uh, the desire or, or the confidence? You see what I'm saying? Yes, I understand. Yeah, because I went through the same thing. I was a big hitter. I missed a lot. Um, It was definitely tough, but I feel like I surrounded myself with, you know, good coaches. My parents were there for me, and, you know, I would lose, and it would be like, okay, well, what did you do well that match that we've been working on in practice? So there weren't that many negatives taken from that match. It was more of, okay, let's get to work right after this match and work on this. And I'm actually really glad that at a young age, I lost a lot. I know that sounds weird, but I helped, it helped me out in the long run. I feel like I've lost yeah. so much that I've learned <laughs> from it as well. <laughs> yeah. And, and, it's, and, and the thing is, in, in tennis, you're going to lose a lot. You know, it, 30, oh, yeah. 32, <laughs> players, 32 pl- players enter a tournament, 31 are going to come out losing. It's just the way it is. Exactly. And so, you know, if, if you don't have a problem – I shouldn't say you should, if you don't have a problem, but if losing doesn't, you know, demoralize you, then it, it makes you stronger. You know, nobody, won't, you don't want to go out there and say, well, we'll try to lose. Obviously you try to win, but if you do lose, it's not the end of the world. And, you know, like you say, you focus on the things that you've been working on. And if you didn't improve the things that you've been working on, then you go out and you try and improve them. So that's, that's a takeaway from that. But, you know, just specifically in your case, where, where, where was your ranking, if you recall, when you were 12 years old? Um, at 12, I honestly, I think I was just playing tournaments in my, uh, in the Ohio Valley. I don't think. Okay. So you really didn't have like a national or a, you didn't have like a national or a (laughs) Midwest type of, you know, high ranking? No, my parents' philosophy was that, you know, they wanted me to win in my area and then I was allowed to Mm -hmm. go play Midwest tournaments. And then when I was winning there, I was allowed to play national. They said you have to win at okay. every level before you move up. Gotcha. Yeah, so, that, that, so I think that's, that's good. Go ahead, Robert. Well, I was going to say reflect upon that time when you were younger and think about the philosophies your parent had and the opinions you had. What are, what are a few that you 
think were right and then reflect upon a few that you think you'd have done different. So in other words, there's a bunch of parents listening right now and they're trying to figure out what's right for their child. What What's something that you think you did well, your parents did well, and then something you wish that they'd have done different? I feel like what they did well was definitely they cared. And when I was younger, you know, it seemed that they were like really harsh on me, but they just cared a lot and they wanted me to be like do well. Um, as a parent, I feel like they should push their kid and want them to do well, but they shouldn't push them into something they don't like. Um, I feel like my parents pushed me to the point where, you know, I still loved the game. I still wanted to be out on the court and they didn't cross that line to where, you know, I didn't even want to touch a racket. Um, one thing I feel like they could do differently or better, I guess, would be probably after matches. I feel like, you know, after you lose, you just want some space. You don't want, you know, um, your parents or coaches to come over to you and start talking about your match. You know, you want to kind of calm down, reflect, and then go talk to everyone. I feel like sometimes, you know, they would come over to me after the match and, you'd still be emotional for the match and you'd get angry. Uh-huh. Yeah. And, and, you know, you've, you've got a younger brother that's following in your path as well. How would you say, maybe what are some of the things that they've learned from you that they've, you know, are doing or not doing with him that would be, di- or I guess, I'm, I guess the question I'm trying to ask is, what are they doing different from hi- with him than they might have done with you if, if, there's, if you can recognize anything? Great question. Um, yeah, that's actually a really good question. Um, I and also, feel like, and also, he he's he's a boy and you're a girl, so there may be some gender things as well. So maybe maybe that might play play a factor in it as well. Yeah, because of the tournament kind of thing, like it's tough right. to know where he should be because at right. his age right now, I was playing the Grand Slams and juniors, and right now he's still playing nationals. Even though he's, you know, he can hit the ball with me. He's a really good player, but. Guys, mm-hmm. it's just completely different. Um, right. But I definitely feel like they – I'm trying to think. That's actually a really good question. I feel like when we're hitting sometimes, my mom will get on my brother. Cause my, if you see me play, I'm a very, like, chill and mellow person on the court. I kind of keep mm-hmm. my emotions in. And my brother's the total opposite. He loves okay. to, you know, <laughs> scream – have a fit, all that kind of stuff. <laughs> so <laughs> when my mom would tell me stuff when I was playing, like practicing, you know, I would kind of hear it but not say anything or show my reaction to it. I would just take it. Uh-huh. Where my brother uh-huh. takes it as a negative and kind of goes crazy. But I think my – so it's it's kind of tough for my mom to uh, learn from what I've done to bring it in, like to do for him, I guess. Because we're two completely yeah. different kind of people and players. Right, but right, right. It's right. just a tough scenario. Where I feel like if he was yeah. more like me, you know, she would definitely um, do some different stuff with him. But it's just so tough because he's actually the total opposite of me. <laughs> yeah, yeah, gotcha. So, gotcha. so tell so, me a moment in your tennis career, okay, where you were working really hard and the results weren't there. And you thought, you know what, I, I, this isn't for me. I'm, I'm gonna give up. It was, it, was there ever a time like that? Um, I don't think there was ever a time that I wanted to give up. But I would honestly say this year, um, I was working my tail off. I think just this, maybe in the past year, I've really been like more dedicated to the game. I feel like in the past years, you know, I was just kind of there. Um, Some days I wouldn't bring all the – I wouldn't put a lot of effort into it sometimes. But I feel like this year, you know, was the first year where I was really, like, paid in. Like, if you want to make it big time, you have to put effort in every day, every hour. Like, dedicate yourself to the game. Um, And I did. And you look at my results at the beginning of the year and some of these pro events, and I didn't make it very far. I was losing – and qualities, you know, maybe first round of main. Um, and I was working hard in practice. I was playing extremely well. It, the results just weren't coming. 
And I had a coach behind me, um, Carrie Rubens. And, you know, Mm -hmm. he said, you just got to think positive. Like, you're doing good things. I can see them in the match. You know, you're going to have a good run at one of these tournaments eventually. Like, keep your head high. After every match I would lose, I'd go back out on court and hit for another hour, two hours with him and work on stuff. Because I would be like, I... I want to win. I want to be better. So after a loss, I'd be like, okay, we need to work on this and we'd go work on it. And I was doing that for a while. And then in October, I made it to the finals of 25,000 in I think it was Sumter, South Carolina. And, and it really showed my progress from the year. I played extremely well. Yeah. And I think it really paid off. And I'm really yeah. glad I hey. didn't just kind of throw in the towel. Right. So did did you ever play zonals when you were a kid in Sumter? Okay. She's I did uh, I did play zonals, but it was in Oklahoma, I think. Yeah, she's uh, in the okay. Midwest section. Yeah. So so real quick for like a minute, tell us tell us did did you enjoy zonals? Was it a good experience? Oh, I absolutely love zonals. It was the best tournament I ever played as a junior because you really got to have a team you weren't just out there by yourself and you got to meet other kids, you know, a different coach. You got to play a bunch of different matches. It was just a bunch of fun. Yeah. And I tell Scott, so my son Everett played zonals this, the last two years and it's just, it's just different, right? I mean, it's, Mm -hmm. it's, it's really the best experience in tennis he's ever had. And I've ever had as a parent just because it lasts so long and the parents get to know each other and, the kids get to know each other, and it's a team environment. Would you agree with that? I would definitely agree with that, yes. Yeah. So, so Peyton, you, you mentioned that you played, like, all four slams at, at what age, when you were 16? I think it was in 2000. Yeah, I think I was 16, yeah. So could you tell us a little bit about sort of how you got into those tournaments? Because, like I say, I don't think you can I'm, – I'm not sure what the pathway is for that. But then talk a little bit about maybe your favorite slam and which one you played at and maybe something that we we as normal people wouldn't really know that goes on at the slams. Could you talk a little bit about, you know, the, that experience and what was unique about those tournaments? Yeah. Um, leading up to those tournaments, to be able to qualify for those, I played a lot of the ITF junior events. Um You know, you had to start small, work your way up, win in the tournaments, get the ranking up, which I did. Uh And my parents said if I qualified for the slams, they would send me to them. So that was my goal for the year before. Um, I would have to say my favorite slam was definitely the Australian Open. I (laughs) probably am a little biased because that was my first slam that I played in. So it probably seemed like way better than it actually was. But, um, no, it was awesome. I remember... I played my first round, had a really tight match, but the crowd, I mean, just being on the court, being at a Grand Slam, watching that, like, tennis being played there as a young kid and me actually being there was just, like, Mm -hmm. amazing. Right, Um, right. The nerves were definitely there. Um, Mm -hmm. I mean, I had it. It's actually the matches on YouTube, and there's a lot of people, I'd say just under 100 people watching me, like it was, it was a lot of fun. Um, mm-hmm. You know, you got escorted to the court after the match. You got escorted back to the lounge. Um, I guess one thing we- that most people wouldn't know that goes on during the slams would be so. There's the junior slams as well, and I actually never knew about mm-hmm. them until I qualified. Um, mm-hmm. And the juniors actually have a different space to go to than the actual pros. So we don't get to share the same locker rooms or like lunch area with the pros. Okay. So was there still some interaction with the the pros? Yeah, you would see them on on the practice courts or like at the U S open, they allowed you to go to the cafe sometimes like, but they were like, you can't just sit here if you're not going to eat. But I mean, you would still (laughs) see the pros walk past you. Like I remember I was eating lunch and like, Djokovic just walked past me. I was like, oh, my gosh, like, Novak Djokovic is right there eating a sandwich. What the heck? <laughs> yeah. Well, that's, uh, that sounds like a lot of fun. But, you know, I get, the, the interesting thing about the slams is obviously the different surfaces. 
And, you know, the red clay and the grass are probably two surfaces that you're not too familiar with. So how did you train for those or how did you adjust to the, the those conditions? Um, red clay, I went out west actually to train on a bit before I left. Um, and then grass was really hard. I yeah. actually found a place up in Columbus that had two grass courts. And I was hitting on them and I was like, huh. Oh, this is what grass is like. Like, this is strange, you know. Um, yeah. I mean, we had we were having like three ball rallies at the Mac, and I was like, this is <laughs> this is very very weird. And the ball would just die. And then I went to play a pre tournament for the Junior Wimbledon, and all of a sudden the ball was bouncing a little more. And I was like, wait, what the heck? What did I just train on back home? <laughs> so yeah, that was Columbus little... grass is not Wimbledon <laughs> grass, right? No, not at all. So that kind of threw me off there for a while. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> and, and when you said you, you you went out west to practice on the clay, where where was that? That was out in Arizona. Really? Okay. Yeah. Huh. I was um, I, I was hoping she was going to uh, say Austin Tennis Academy, Scott. Then that would have been yeah. a good connection. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but uh, I'm. Well, I used to when I I went to college at Arizona State, and the club that I worked at had a couple of red clay courts when I was there, but they were constantly, you know, just super dry. We needed to water them all the time, and now they're a parking lot. So I don't know where where did you find <laughs> the red clay courts? It was in um, Scottsdale, Arizona. Huh. Okay. I'm not. Yeah. Uh, I say since I, they must they must be new since I've left, but uh, yeah, the yeah, ones that we used to have are, are no longer there, but. Uh, well, that's, 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 yeah, I'm sure that uh, the Arizona clay is different from the French clay as well. Oh, yeah. Yes. <laughs> yeah. So, an interesting sort of funny story is, you know, I, I actually first met Peyton when she was probably maybe 13, maybe 14, when I was at the Western really? Southern Open and I was watching, yeah, I was watching uh, a match with Rayonich and Feliciano Lopez and uh sitting next to this girl and she had like a, a player pass on and it had you know guest of Feliciano Lopez and so I talked to her a little bit and she said her name and I because my son had been to Smith Stearns the name Stearns stuck in my mind or stuck in my head for some reason so anyways but turns out at Western and Southern did, didn't Feliciano Lopez stay at your your, your house uh, no, but we're really, really good friends with him. Okay, so you're, you're okay. So you're just close friends. Okay, so can you talk a little bit about some of your maybe your Western Southern experiences, and were you ever a ball girl there, or because you know, like I say it's, it's such a great tournament to have in Cincinnati, you know, especially if you don't get a chance to go to the U.S. Open or a Slam. All the players are there, and it's super intimate um, and everything. So maybe just talk a little bit about you know how that tournament, what that tournament meant to you, being from Cincinnati. I mean, I've wanted to play in this tournament since I've picked up a racket. Um, I have been going to this tournament since I was maybe five or six. My parents have box seats on center court, same seats every year. Um, mm -hmm. I've never been a ball girl, actually. I've never really wanted to be a ball girl. I think just because I wanted to be playing and I feel like I'd be like, oh, I want to be playing. I don't want to be a ball girl. So mm -hmm. I sat on the sidelines and watched. Um this year I tried I signed up for a wild card. I didn't get it. I think my ranking was a little too low. Um, but I mean my rankings I think around five hundred WTA right now and hopefully I get it a little bit higher before this tournament comes along and I mean it would mean the world for me to play in this tournament. Um like hometown, right. I live five minutes away. Yeah. It's it's just a crazy story, you know. The tournament's in yeah. Mason, I live in Mason. I've been going to this <laughs> tournament since I was five, six. Like, that's yeah. incredible. Yeah. Yeah, and it, 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 it is great also, you know, we mentioned, you know, the Wolves and McNally's and, you know, JJ and um, John both played in qualifying this year. And, you know, w when we were there for those matches, you know, they were the stadiums were packed. You know, you talk about, you know, having a, a stadium full of people you know, these, you know, they're playing on like court three, which has a ton of seating. And they were, you know, the, the people were up, up the way up on the, on, on the side. So it would be great for you to, to have that same experience. So hopefully this year you, you get that. Yeah, I really hope so. 
Yeah. Well, I'm so, and so whoever runs the tournament, I, I think they need to uh, they need to let you in, right? So I mean, I think, <laughs> I, I, I think I'd be the, I'd be there to watch if they did. Yeah, yeah. So sell some sell some tickets. We'll get we we'll get people on the stands because yeah, we like, already uh, have yeah, two it, sold. <laughs> yeah, yeah some, right. some random too. Some, yeah, some <laughs> random Russian playing. I I I want to see Katie play, right? So let yeah, let's sell some yeah. tickets, like Scott said. Yeah, let's do it. Um, excellent. Um, let's see. So, so what are some of your, uh, like you say, you know, right now you're trying to get your ranking up. So, what are some of your tournaments that you have you, you have um, on on your schedule coming up? Um, so my first tournament of the year, I will probably go out to Malibu for twenty five thousand, um, mm-hmm. and then I'll come back home. Hopefully, I'm signing up for a wild card for the hundred thousand up in Midland, Michigan. Um, hopefully, I get into yeah. that. And then I'll go play the Lexington tournament. Um, they actually have a hundred thousand there in February. Um, it's the first yeah. time. So yeah, yeah. I just, I just, yeah, I just, I just heard about that tonight that they're, they have this hundred thousand tournament in Lexington. That's that's new, right? Yeah, yeah, that's awesome. Wow. It's near me wow. as well. Um, yeah, and then, Scott, does it mean it's it Lexington? Yeah, we're about yeah. Lexington's about an hour from Louisville, but a hundred thousand k tournament. That's pretty much you know an, a WTA level event, right? Yes. Uh, yeah, so it's it's yes, very close to it. it. So, yeah, it's it's pro, it's it's the highest level non WTA, right? Yes. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, anyways, yes, but it's, uh, yeah, it's in February, right? Yeah, and is at, it I'm sure it'll be the University of Kentucky. Where is it? No, it, I'm sure it'll be at uh, Top Seed. Do you know? Do you know where they're going to hold it, Peyton? I, I think it's Top Seed. Yeah, and Top Seed is it's a new club that was open in Lexington a little while ago, and they're starting to get some really good level tournaments, some ITF tournaments for juniors. Um, this tournament, but it's a fantastic um, viewing. Um, what do you call it? Uh, balcony or mezzanine where, you know, basically every, all 12 courts that are indoors, you know, you can get behind the courts and all all of them have good seating. So it's a, I think it's a fantastic host site for a tournament like that because they'll do a good job. And the people there, every every time that we've had a tournament there, they've been, you know, super, um, you know, welcoming and they're really excited to have, you know, events there. So I'm sure they'll do a great job with it. So we're looking forward to that. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, it is awesome. Yeah. Um, and so, and then also talk a little bit about, you know, right now you're sort of in that transition phase from, you know, going to college perhaps in a, in a year, you're graduating class of 2020. So, and you know, you'll graduate from high school in, in next spring. So what are your, you know, plans as far as, you know, college recruitment goes and what are you thinking there? Yeah, um, I'm definitely going to college as of now. Um, I've kind of narrowed down my choices to a few. Um, I need to go visit another school to make sure that, you know, what I'm, the decision I'm going to be making is okay. Um, And I guess, I don't know if you know about this rule, but at some schools I can go for a year and I can leave and go professional. And if it doesn't work out or I want to come back and get an education, I can come back and they pay for it. So that's wow. like a no brainer. Yeah. Right. And for sure. For sure. My parents and, are like, and, you need to go to college and do that for sure. Yeah, for sure. So you, did you, you said that that is that for every school or how, how, you said that it sounded like there's a qualifier in there. Is that for every, uh, does that go for every, it, every school? No, I think it's only from, for some schools and it's, they only hmm. offer it to some players. Okay. Yeah, I, I know that Noah Rubin said that that's the deal he got at Wake Forest, where he can go back at any time and get his degree. And so, like you say, you know, it's a no-brainer to go. You know, it's just yeah. it's, you know, it's, it can be as small as a you know four-month commitment, but you get a great education, great coaching, great facilities. Why wouldn't you do that? That's right. Exactly. Yeah. yeah so, 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 so right. as you as you make your decisions. What are the things that are important to you? Is it the coaching, the location, the what, the schedule they play, the conference they're in? What are what are your what goes into your decision making? Um, definitely the coach if they're going to help me develop my game. As and then another thing is is will the 
the coach bring me to professional tournaments because I don't want to go to college for that semester a year and not play any or keep up points. And then I leave after a year and I have nothing. Um, right. So I know one school is offering that, you know, uh, all the schools can bring me to seven tournaments and they pay for seven. And But this one school saying, you know, you can go to 10, 11, but you just pay for those extra three, four on your own, which mm-hmm. my yeah. parents said they would help out. So that's awesome. Um, yeah. So I really like that part. That's another big one. Okay. Another big one is, and, you know, uh, yes, go ahead. <laughs> okay, yeah. Sorry. So when you, when you say when you say playing professional tournaments, is that in the fall when there's not really the team schedule, or is that, you know, both spring and fall? Um, it's mostly in the fall, I think. Right, right. Yeah, I'm just, I'm just curious, you know, in the fall, you know, it, it seems like it's more of an individual time, whereas the spring is, you know, it's really the team, um, you know, dual dual matches and, you know, obviously the, the NCAA tournament and things like that where there, there, may, there may be some expectation that, you know, if you're going to play, that they need you there for at least, you know, the tournament and the big some of the big matches, but work around, you know, the schedule the rest of the time. Yeah, I think – yeah. In the spring, they're like, we want you at these tournaments. Um, if we right. don't have a tournament, you're allowed to go play in a, sure. a pro tournament. Sure. 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 So listening to what's important to you was good, but what are what are some of the comments your parents are making? What uh, what goes into their decision making? Are they wanting you to go to a place that, say, offers more money or a place that is a better scholarship or maybe a guarantee after you give it a whirl on the pro tour? What What are your parents? comments in the decision making um my parents want you know everything in writing they said if (laughs) you're going to go for a year and leave they want it in writing if they're going to bring me to seven tournaments they want it in writing like they said not that they don't trust the coach it's just what if the coach were to leave or someone was to leave and all of a sudden the new coach or the new person coming in said no i don't agree with that um if it's in writing and you sign it like they have to agree to those terms. Um, another is, is, you know, they're like, you need to go to college because you have to have the education behind you, which I agree because, I mean, there's not that many people in the top 50. There's 50 people in the top 50 out of so many. Like, the odds <laughs> right. that you make it aren't that high, you know. Um, you need to yeah. have a backup yeah. plan. Plus, you know, right. I could get injured at any moment in my career and yeah. – I'm going to need a backup plan. So, I mean, that's a really nice backup plan, especially because they pay for it as well. Well, and, and everything you just said was great advice. You know, I never thought about that. But if the if the the coach is promising, come play one year, and then if you go pro, you can finish out your career, let's get that in writing, right? So if the coach mm-hmm. switches from one to another, hey, well, we've got a contract, right? So that's that's great advice you just gave. Then that's good advice yeah. your parents are giving you too, I think. Yeah. Yeah. They they've been giving me really good advice along the way. Yeah, and so you as we've had this conversation, I've been really impressed with sort of the the wisdom that your parents have in this given that, you know, you're the first tennis player in your family basically. So how do they, you know, obtain this wisdom? Do they, you know, have other people they talk to or is it just sort of just the way that they do run, run everyday life? This is just how they are. Um, I mean, my mom was a big time athlete as a gymnast. So she yeah. kind of knows like the athletic side a little bit more. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Sorry. Um, and my dad owns a business, so he knows the business side of it. So together they're oh. like really good at putting yeah. the puzzles, like <laughs> the pieces of the puzzle together. Um, yeah. As to the tennis part, you know, that was just something my mom picked up on along the way because, you know, she would drive my brother and I everywhere all the time. Uh And she'd have to sit through those lessons and watch his hit. And she was, I like, kudos to her because she listened to everything along the way. And I think she's actually learned more about tennis than (laughs) she ever would before because of just sitting during these lessons and listening. So sometimes she'll be like, Peyton, do this. I'm like, wait, how do you know that, Mom? (laughs) (laughs) 
<laughs> right. But, and, exactly. And one of the things I noticed is is I see some of the best players, right? Some of the best tennis players that are around us, and their parents never played tennis, but because they did exactly what you just said, they could take a four year old and make them a pretty good tennis player just because of all they learned in the process of helping you become a good tennis player. Right. And so your yeah. mom, I don't know how good a tennis player your mom or dad is. They may not. not be very good. <laughs> right. But but I believe based on what you just said, that they could guide another young person through the process of being good, even though they can't even maybe be the three O player or whatever, you know? Yeah, definitely. They have a and lot of and one thing college. you that's right. And one thing you see, like with Nick Boloteri, they say that, you know, he couldn't play his way out of a wet paper sack, right? But he knew how to get you to be good, right? Right. And they, they said yeah. that he got like the three five level was the highest he ever got, which UTR wise would be like a a three UTR or you know somewhere in there, which isn't very good. But the fact that he knew what you needed to do to be good was valuable. And so your parents, even though they weren't tennis players, figured it out. And I I think that's important because there's probably a lot lot more parents out there that knew nothing when their child got into this. And and the fact that your parents learned all they could learn and figured it out is, is very valuable to you, but also commendable on their end. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. They invested a lot of time in that. Yeah. So, so Robert, we're we're getting up on sort of the, the approaching the the end here. Do you want to ask a final question? Then I've got a few short, uh, quick hits for for Peyton, and we can wrap it up. Yeah. So I, I just I want you to real quick reflect on um, a moment because every I, I can just think every tennis player has that moment where they work super hard they're like 13 or 12 or 14 or whatever. And they work super hard and they go to a tournament and then they just, they get destroyed. It's a horrible tournament. They play terrible. And the ride home is just like silent, right? It's miserable. (laughs) And then then six months later, they have a great experience in a tournament. Did you ever have a moment where you, it was just like, this may not be my sport or, you, you know, what in the world? And then you came out of it. Can you kind of tell us a moment like that? Oh, yeah. Um, I've had plenty of those moments uh, when I was younger. Um, I actually went through a rut for a little bit because I felt like I was working so hard and then I just wasn't doing very well. So I felt like I just wasn't, like, that good. And it kind of took a while for me to get out of that. Um but I would have to say, I think I was 14, and I was playing the Midwest closed. I think down in the South, they call it Southerns, maybe, the Southern something like Club. that. Yeah, Southern Club. That's closed. right. Yeah. You got it. You're right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I was playing. We have, like, a pre-tournament for each section in the Midwest for you to get into that. And the tournament, right. I played a tournament before that, and I was training super hard, and I, like, got demolished first round. And I was just, like, mm. heartbroken. I was, like... I'm not going to do well. I'm not going to qualify for Midwest Clothes because I was playing 16s that year and I was 14. And I went in and I won singles and doubles in the pre-tournament for my section. And I was like, oh, okay, like, that was good. You know, but it was expected. I was the one seed for both. Right. Um, right. And I go into the Midwest Clothes and I win singles and doubles at the Midwest Clothes as a 14-year-old in 16s. So I feel like that was just, like, a big turnaround. Like, I just immediately, like, turned around after that loss. And that kind of got me out of the rut for a little bit as well. Wow. Yeah. And and what were those those car ride home like? What, I mean, you know, you're riding home with your mom and dad and after getting just – but before you had the success, but after getting destroyed, maybe one and one against the, somebody you should have beat, what what was that car ride like? To be honest, they were horrible. <laughs> um, <laughs> they were. It was the worst feeling ever because you know you could just feel like they wanted you to win so bad and you wanted to win so bad and just didn't happen. The disappointment. Um, no, but my parents were actually really good about that. Actually, um, I felt like 
when I lost, they focused more on, okay, did I try? Did I do the correct things? Or, you know, did I, uh, was I moody out on court? And if any of those three was, yes, I was moody or yes, I didn't try or I didn't do the stuff I've been working on, then I would get in trouble at the car ride home. But if I did all three of those and I still lost, you know, my mom would still be like, oh, I wish you would have won. You played so well. You did everything right. <laughs> but, you know, it was still it was still not the best car ride, but I didn't get in trouble because, and I feel like that's something parents should kind of look at, you know. Don't, don't yeah. get mad at your kids if they're trying out there. They're, like, fighting. They're doing the stuff they're supposed to be doing, and they're losing. Like, there's nothing that kid can do. They're trying their best, but if the kid's right. out there not trying, throwing their racket, having a bad attitude, cheating, then, yeah, like, that kid deserves to be yelled at. Like, that's not okay. Yeah. <laughs> right, right, right. Yeah, it's, it's the it's the effort and attitude that needs to be reprimanded as opposed to the, you know, the results or the, you know, the the just whatever their ability might be. Exactly. Yeah, and and it's the challenge too is when you play the right way as a as a say an eleven year old and Scott will see me say it all the time. Every time you see a kid, they're playing from the baseline well. They get the short ball, they destroy the short ball, and then they get an overhead and they hit the overhead in the net. Right? And I, I call that <laughs> the classic call twelve hundred point. Yeah, classic twelve hundred <laughs> point. Right? And you're thinking when they're fourteen, they're going to hit that overhead and win the point. But it's so funny that kid at the net hits that overhead in the net and they're just destroyed mentally. And the kid at the baseline is going, let's go, you know, and you're thinking, <laughs> yeah, exactly. You're thinking, well, the kid at the net should have won the point. They did everything right, but yeah. make the overhead. Right. right. Yeah. And, and so it's hard as a parent because you're going home and you're like, look, you know, when you're 14, you're going to win that point, that match. But you, you know, right now you just couldn't make the overhead, you know. Yeah. And and so I think that's where that that car ride home. It, I, I like what you said. If I was doing those three things well, they were encouraging. But if I was being a punk on the court, being emotional, then they fussed at me, right? That's fair. Yeah, yeah. it is. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, Peyton, thanks so much for your time. But if you got uh, a couple more minutes, we got a few quick questions, and then we'll let you go. Okay. Okay. Sounds good. All right. So, so obviously you've been around the game at the highest levels. So, could you talk? Can you tell us who is your favorite hitting partner or somebody that you've played against? Um, I would definitely say my favorite hitting partner is Carrie Rubin. <laughs> Okay. Um, Shout out to Carrie Rubin uh, of Lexington, Kentucky, right? Oh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Favorite right. match? And I, don't, yeah. I don't know. I don't think I have one. Okay. Come okay. on. You, you, and, there's got to be a match where you were like, you lost the first set 6-0, you were down 4-0, and then you, just, <laughs> you figured it out. There's got to be one like that. I mean, I guess uh, – it probably isn't my favorite match because it never should have been this close. But Australian <laughs> Open, when I played at the Slam, it was 6 okay. 2. And I was up in the second set. We had a tiebreaker. And I was up in the tiebreaker 6 4. Ended up losing the tiebreaker 9 7. And then in the third set, I was we played a full third. And then that tiebreaker for the third set, I was down 2 6. And I came back and I won ten eight. <laughs> so, uh, uh, that's incredible. Uh, that was, I, 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 yeah, yeah, that was an were, emotional <laughs> So was that was wow. that third set tiebreaker? You were down. You said six two. So you, you're down four match points. Yeah. yeah. Wow. Yeah. So, so come on. So yeah, what, that, that, what that's that's, a, that's an easy answer. Yeah. And so did you change anything or did they just start missing? Like, did they get nervous or did you start like, did you change your strategy or did you say, what the heck? I'm down two six. I'm just going to slap at everything. And you started hitting winners. What happened? <laughs> um, honestly, I was, I was a bit nervous. And when I'm nervous, you know, I kind of get on edge and I think at two six, I kind of turned to the coach who was with me and I go, you know what? Like, 
if I'm going to lose, I'm going to lose playing my game. I'm going to hit the ball where I want it to and do what I want to. And my coach that was with me was like, okay, you do you. And <laughs> I did. And I was banging forehands, going after shots. Like, you know, I was taking risks, but I was I trusted myself completely. And it worked right. out, you know. Like, awesome. because I trusted myself so much, I ended up winning that match. Do you, do you awesome. ever wonder, like, gosh, why don't I just do that from the start of the match? <laughs> oh, yes, all the time. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, that's that's uh, that's why tennis is a mental game, right? Oh yeah. Right. yeah. All right. So if you could hit with one player, who would it be? Better. Better, of course. Oh, sure. Of course. I mean, I knew she was going to say Scott Coulson, but I mean, well, if Scott's yeah. not available, then it's right. going to be it's going to be better. Yeah, she, and she already has Kira Rubin, so she's already got someone better than me. So it's uh, that, that's not that's not on her list at all. All right, what's your what's your what's your favorite uh, tennis movie, documentary, or book? Good one. I would have to say I have the favorite book is the Agassi book. Um, okay. I actually had to do a report on it, and I still really? have it up in my room. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I had to read the book and do this little like arty craft thing with it. And I think I learned a lot from that book, actually. What? All right. So, like, so like what? what? Are, well, yeah. Go ahead. What book was it? Um, oh no, no, what no. Did no you what, learn? It, you said you learned a lot. What did you learn? Oh, oh, what did I oh. learn? I mean, I I didn't know like how extreme tennis was at the time. So I think this was in fifth, sixth grade. And oh, I was wow. like, okay. Yes, yeah, so, you know, I'm reading this and the things Agassi Dad is like having him do i was just like oh my right. gosh like i'm gonna have to do this to be that good and yeah i think from then on i kind of had a different perspective of how like people coached me i was like this isn't even close to what Agassi's dad did so like i'm gonna do it you know what i mean like I'm, <laughs> yeah it's a bad thing yeah yeah no, that's awesome so um and you're I talking like, like the green hard. monster where he would set the ball machine up and fire balls at him as far as hard oh gosh that what you're <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> So, I mean, that's, um, that's a good experience because you realize, hey, whatever this coach is asking me to do, it's not as bad as Agassi, right? I can, if Agassi exactly. can do it, I can do it too, right? Exactly, yeah. 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 All right, and do you have a favorite uh, movie or documentary about tennis? Um, No, I don't think I've watched okay. that many tennis movies. Yeah, there aren't, there aren't oh. that many out there. So uh, yeah. there, There's yeah. one really good one you need to watch. What is it? Yeah, so go on Amazon and, and search fifty thousand bombs. Okay. You, you'll love you'll you'll love it. It's so good, and yeah. and it's we just had one of the kids, one of the guys that was on it is now an adult working on Wall Street. Am I right, Scott? When I signed up Wall Street, yeah, in New York? yeah, he's a, he's, a best, he's, he's in banking. Yeah, yeah, and he's oh, uh, wow. but yeah, go on Amazon and search fifty thousand bombs. It's really good. You'll love it. Yeah, another good okay, one that we just it. watched was the, the the Andy Murray documentary um, resurfacing is on Amazon as well, so you can stream that one. That one's worth watching as well. Um, oh yeah, I heard right. that one's good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And all right, so last question: um, Would you recommend anything that you'd recommend uh, non tennis um, on Netflix, Amazon Prime? Any series that you think uh, you know that, that you really liked? That's a great question because um, over the Christmas break, I need something to watch. That's a great question. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm terrible at remembering, like, movie names and everything. Um, Just describe us what's happening. We'll know. <laughs> I love watching the underdog kind of movies. Um, there's this one. It's about it's, – it's football. There's a lot of football and baseball ones where, like, the underdog comes in and stuff like that. There's a lot on Netflix. I think if you – Look up Underdog on Netflix, a bunch of them pop up. Um, okay. And then I also love reading, like, kind of those um, inspirational kind of books or motivation kind of books. Okay. Um, I love reading those kind of books, so. Like, like right. any, any, Anyone that, it, it, yeah, something that you might recommend to a, to a junior tennis player. Um, there's, you know, I, I don't know the name. It's really bad because I, just read it actually, and I did all this highlighting. 
I'm telling you, I'm really bad at remembering names. Um, you right. you, you sound just like me. See, Scott, Scott yeah. always gives me a hard time because I know nobody's name, right? No, right. no book's yeah. name, no, no movie's name. So no I, tennis I player's like, name. Yeah. Yeah, Scott will say, I watch so-and-so on TV, and I'm going, well, who's that, you know? Yeah. <laughs> but, but yeah, I it's see really a picture of him, I know exactly what you're talking about. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> right. So, so what's the book about? Tell, get, the reason we're asking oh. is we want our boys. We want our boys to read the same book. Give it. Give us a little bit yeah. so we can search it on Google. Yeah, and I, I'll find out the name for sure. I think it's downstairs actually. Um, but mm-hmm. it's really just helps you kind of like get in that mental state. Like it honestly has helped me. You know, like when you're not feeling up to par, like are you going to go out to practice and not work your hardest? Because that is going to go into the match. If you whatever you put into practice is coming out in the match, um, right, right. And it's just kind of like that kind of mindset. Mm-hmm. Like you need to work hard every day. Um, also, another really good part about that book is it helps me out with like breathing on court. It kind mm-hmm. of helps you set some rituals. Like you know, okay, some things aren't going your way. Start some box breathing, which is where. You breathe in for like four seconds, you hold it in for four seconds, exhale four, hold for four. And you do that maybe like two times in between points. You know, you go to the back fence, do that, mm-hmm. breathe in, breathe out, hold, go to your towel, and then go back to the next point with like a clear mind and get ready to play. Yeah, I like that. Yeah, so, th- so this yeah, was a tennis-specific book? Yeah, I think it was like tennis and um, one other sport maybe. It was like a mix. Okay. And okay. then there was another one that had like a famous mental coach. He wrote it. Mm-hmm. He worked with like LeBron yeah. and other famous like people. Okay. And did, did you ever did, kind of, did you did you ever work with a mental coach? Um, down at USTA when I would go down there, I did. Yes, and I okay. actually just started working with one. He's with USTA up in New York. Uh, his name's um, Mark. He's awesome. He's helped me set some rituals. You know. Sometimes I get mm-hmm. I overthink on court and that what that's what kills me during my matches. Like it's not that I can't play, yep. it's that I overthink. Right. And he's kinda right. helped me get over that hump and I still am, but it loads better now. Yeah, so, you, so, so at you what think age that, that was beneficial? Sorry. You think that was beneficial? Oh, one hundred percent, yes. And, and what I age would like, you think Yeah, go ahead, I'm sorry. But I, I think, like, I was just about to say about the age thing. Like, I think if yeah. I had a mental coach three years ago, I honestly don't think I'd be listening to what they said. Um, I'd be like, this is uh-huh. boring. Why am I listening to this guy talk okay. about breathing on right. the court? Um, <laughs> but I think yeah. now that I know, like, you know what I mean? Like, at, and at a young age, yeah. I, I really don't think, like, that. Yeah, you don't have the maturity. Play. Right. Um, yeah, exactly. And I think when you get a little more mature, um, like me now this year, I think I realized how big the mental part is of a game, um, and it's right. helped me tremendously. But I think if you're young and, you know, you're really going to listen to them, then, like, it's not a bad idea. But I think if you're the kind you're, of kid who's just like – like me, personally, I'd be like, why – I don't want to listen to this guy talk to me for now. I want to go out in the court and play. Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, I can picture the average teenager sitting on the couch thinking – just give me my phone. What are you? You're talking about breathing, right. really? Like, I, 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 let me get on. Yeah, Instagram, I breathe all. Right? I breathe all the time. I know what to do. Yeah, yeah even when I'm sleeping, I'm breathing. What are you talking about breathing? <laughs> yeah. Right. It, so, so timing is everything, right? Timing matters. Yeah. Exactly. You introduce them. Yeah. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, hey, um, Peyton, thanks so much for doing this. I know we had a hard time uh getting connected but i'm sure i'm glad we had this conversation a lot of fun for us we had we learned a lot and uh i hope you had a good time too yeah definitely thank you so much for having me yeah stay in touch this was fun yeah and we'll uh, look forward to seeing you in lexington here in a couple months thanks for listening to the payers and players podcast if you would visit us on our website payersandplayers.com also we're really excited about some of our upcoming guests So we've got Jack Newman, uh, who works at the Austin Tennis Academy. We've also got Adam Blitcher, who runs one of the best tennis podcasts 
that I've personally ever listened to. And then also uh, an Ohio State tennis standout, J.J. Wolf.